This is part two of my multi-series comprehensive videos on moving to the country, a rural location for a more sustainable lifestyle. You will want to watch each part as the information supplied builds on the last part. You know, watching these videos is not going to make you an expert. That is my job. But it will make you a lot more comfortable with the process and have a better understanding of the process. You will have me along when looking at properties and be the recipient of my many years of experience, both living in a rural area and being a realtor who loves matching folks up with property in rural areas. I don't candy coat stuff and gloss over problems that I see just to get you to buy a property quickly. No, I am honest and point out all the positives I see along with the negatives. And after we've looked at a few properties, I'll say, these are the positives I see on all these properties. And these are the negatives. Aside from your personal preference, I will probably point out what I believe to be the best value of all the properties we've looked at. So call or text me to start your own moving experience. I have no way of contacting you, so you must initiate the relationship or we will never meet. This is Joseph Nelson. I am a licensed realtor, real estate broker in the states of both Oregon and Washington. I make educational videos relating to moving and living in the Portland, Vancouver area. Southwest Washington is geographically and economically an extension of the Portland metro region, but void of most of the problems that plague Portland. In fact, Portland is number six on the list of cities where people are exiting the cities in the United States. Southwest Washington, in contrast, is growing in population and like my wife and I, we have moved from Portland to Southwest Washington with many benefits. And just so you know, living in some of the suburbs outside of Portland, Multnomah County, are still a great choice. If you work on the west side, for instance, in the Silicon Forest of Hillsboro, the drive from Southwest Washington to work in Hillsboro would be daunting. And I would not recommend that. So Beaverton, Hillsboro. West Lynn, Lake Oswego, Wilsonville would all be awesome choices if you're working on the west side. Commuting an hour to an hour and a half each direction does nothing to add to your lifestyle, unless your lifestyle is sitting in a car. And I've made videos on all these communities, but the big thing you'll have to overcome living in Oregon, there is no getting around Oregon income tax. And that is a big reason why my wife and I have moved to Washington. So let's do a very quick review of the main points in video number one. The drivers for property values. These should always be top of mind when you look at property. Location. The further you get away from the city, the cheaper property becomes. And the inverse is true as well. The closer to the city, the more expensive. So location is number one. Number two, the condition and size of the home and what the value of that home is. Number three, the usability of the land. For instance, when my wife and I were looking at property, we went to a five acre property, which the house and the property looked awesome on the internet. We found out that four of the five acres were in a wetland and totally unusable other than, you know, ducks and geese and wildlife, which is great. But the problem is it had about one quarter of an acre around the house, which was usable and uh, very close to the street and had no privacy and no shop but it was a nicer stick built home. So, you know, all these factors play against one another. Number four is the size and condition of a shop or barn. Some of the properties were so steep that a tractor would not have been able to maneuver down the slope. And at my age, I'm not going to be walking up and down a super steep slope, dragging firewood up to the top. One was really nice, uh, it was secluded, it had a nice garage, a beautiful home, larger than one of the largest ones we were looking at, but the ground on the property was all super squishy. Everywhere you walked, it was just mushy. 
And there's no fixing that. If you've got a mushy property and you want to do anything ag related, that's a no starter. Okay, so let's move forward with the content of video number two. I know this video is titled about Southwest Washington, but there are some due to work location that just won't be able to live there. So let's talk about a little bit larger um, expansion of region. My favorite county in Washington is Cowlitz County. That being said, we move to Clark County. It is the county that includes Vancouver, the most populous county in Southwest Washington. As such, you're gonna see more restrictions on land use here, such as adding dwellings for maybe an Airbnb, etc. But we found the perfect property that meets our needs overall, which is close to work. So all these decisions are based on a series of compromises. But that said, unincorporated counties, in other words, outside of the city limits. Now you're going to still have a city address, be it uh, Battleground, be it Vancouver, be it Ridgefield, etc. But these are mailing addresses and you, you may or may not be outside the city limits of these towns. In the unincorporated county areas, your taxes are typically a lot less because you're not paying for things like mass transit, city police, etc. And of the three metro counties in the Portland area on the Oregon side, Clackamas is my favorite. Clackamas County offers the best rural lifestyle, lower taxes, no large cities. I would definitely avoid Multnomah County as their taxes are oppressive. There are some extremely beautiful properties that overlook the Columbia Gorge and the Corbett area. But long term, especially when you reach retirement age, the taxes there may run you out of your property. You simply may not be able to afford to live there anymore. If you're working in the Silicon Forest on the west side, then rural Washington County would be your choice. The prices are a bit higher than in Clackamas County and Southwest Washington, but this is the price you're gonna pay for the convenience of uh, living close to work. So now let's talk about some features of land. Soil composition. The soils here generally tend to be of clay nature. Adding sand to clay makes concrete. Let's not do that. I spent 30 years as a landscape contractor. I know what I'm talking about. Organic matter, compost, is the material of choice for improving soil conditions in clay. Some sites are really rocky. Others, no rock at all. This can vary uh, down to the property. We, I lived in a property, my neighbors had tons of rocks. On our property, we had no rock. So you can't just make a blanket statement about that area's got lots of rock. It's going to be site dependent. You may look in an area that has you scratching your head, you're way up on the top of a hill and there's a lot of river rock. Why is there river rock on the top of the hill? The answer is there was thousands of years ago, there was a glacier in Montana that was melting and finally broke and made its way all the way into the, the Portland, Vancouver area. And as such, it left a lot of rock in its path. So depending on your use of the land, rock may be a deal breaker. If you plan on plowing or tilling, you know, rock's not fun. And you'll find yourself having to manually remove rocks after you disturb the soil. But rocks contain minerals and minerals are good for the soil. The property we recently purchased has a fair amount of um, say three to 10 inch river rock in the soil. When we move soil, uh, we have maybe 10% going back out of a scoop in the tractor, that's rock. But we have no pasture and we're all uh, landscaped area around the house and trees, wooded forest. So the only time I really hit rocks with my shovel is when I'm setting a mole trap, for instance. So I am planning on gardening the no dig method where you loosen the soil with a, what is called a broad fork you stick it in the ground and you pull back on it and you loosen the soil and then you pile compost on top of that soil to plant your vegetable garden in. You place down cardboard under the compost to smother out any uh, grass or weeds. And by the time the cardboard decomposes, the weeds are dead. Tilling the soil also brings up new seeds from the soil. When I used to do projects in landscaping, we'd 
till a guy's yard for putting in a lawn and he'd say your your grass seed had weed seeds in it and that's not the case each bag of uh, seed was uh, certified with a percentage of um, non-target seeds and it's extremely low the truth is these seeds were brought up in the tilling process and after the grass becomes established we'll have to do some selective weed control and seeds can live in the soil for decades so really breaking the weed cycle with tilling is almost impossible if you are interested in this process then look on youtube i know you use youtube because you're here right now look up permaculture or no dig gardening even market gardeners use this process because it greatly reduces the amount of labor they have in weeding so the rocks do not impact the way we plan on using the property we bought. And as a side benefit, rocky soils tend to generally have good drainage. And we bought this property in February and walked it and the soil was not mushy. It was nice and firm, even though it had rained a lot recently. But we will need to evaluate each property based on your intended use. For us, poor drainage was a deal breaker. Livestock would be standing in mud all winter. Poor drainage also affects the uh, type of septic system that would be approved for your property. And even though it may have a standard septic now, if you go to replace it because it fails, you may not have the percolation of water through the soil uh, through testing that would allow a standard septic system and you'll need a much more expensive uh, for instance, sand filter system. Poor drainage also reduces the lifespan of um, a standard septic system. Good drainage will provide for a lifetime of use of a septic system as long as it is maintained properly. Property types. We all have our preferences for property types and topography, whether it's flat or hilly, etc. I prefer hills or rolling hills myself, but that's me. That may not be you. If uh, horses or cattle are high on your radar screen, most properties set up for livestock will be in flat farm areas rather than hilly forested areas. But we want to look at the vegetation in the area and see if we can identify wet areas because there are native plants that will only grow in areas that have saturated soils. And here's another benefit of using a realtor that has uh, 30 years of horticultural experience you know, everybody knows cattails grow in swamps, but it goes down a lot further than that to the point of horsetail, uh, sedges, the type of grasses that are growing, etc. These are all telltale examples of poor drainage on a property, even in the summer when there's no standing water. So specific plants will grow in areas that are wet and tell us that the soil's ability to perk is uh, poor. Fencing is important in pastured areas. It's extremely expensive to put up new fencing. So the um, existence of an existing uh, livestock fence is a huge advantage. Most fencing materials are made of metal and we all know what the price of metal has done in recent years, it's gone way up. Outbuildings are also vital to keeping livestock. Pole buildings, whether used as a shop or as a barn are going to cost tens of thousands to erect. The shop on my property that I recently purchased has a shop that has an estimated value of $80,000 and was built about four years ago. The issue with flat land is you tend to not have a lot of privacy. Even with five acres, you could see three or four other houses uh, on the edge of your five acres. I prefer the rolling hills where I don't see any neighbors, but my intended use may be different than yours. How much land do you need? Question mark. I would say for horses and cattle, um, five acres minimum. But the more land you have, the less you're going to have to feed them in the winter. So more is better. Homesteads with uh, cattle, pigs, chickens, large garden area, it's recommended 15 acres. We don't want to see pasture areas that are overgrazed as that causes us to have to reseed because the animals will eat it down to nothing. You know, driving around, I hate seeing horses in small paddocks where they're standing in mud all winter long and there's not a stitch of grass to be seen. So plan on at least an acre per animal. 
hilly forested areas, approximately an acre and a half of flat land around your home will provide enough uh, land to produce a quite sustainable garden and have chickens. The rest being forested, three and a half acres out of the five, to me, it would be an ideal situation because the work demand in the forest is much less than it is in areas where you have to mow and maintain. The forest is pretty self-maintaining. So most of the area around the home, the acre and a half, is um, gravel or grass. We have about three quarters of an acre of grass at my house, and I can mow it in about 45 minutes. I do some weed control here and there, especially in the gravel, and that's about the extent to the ongoing maintenance on my property. Now, depending on your desire for a level of landscape performance, being a retired landscaper, I have probably a higher expectation of um, landscaping than a lot of folks do. So we, wa we fertilize the lawn once a month, and we water the lawn all summer long. Most wells allow for irrigating one acre without a special permit. I recently did chemical selective weed control on our lawn areas, and we have no more dandelions or weeds. During the growing season, I mow twice a week. This allows for removing only a small percentage of the grass blade each time you mow. That's the best horticultural practice. You'll notice some people will mow their lawn super short and scalp it down because that stunts it, and then they don't have to mow it again for a while. Personally, I'd rather see it screaming green, be a little longer, and mow it more often. So I think, you know, around an acre to an acre and a half around the home is a good amount of land to have. You want to have good fencing, especially if you have dogs. Ideally, you've got uh, firewood available on your property, as we do. We are in the process of cutting down dead trees and cutting up fallen trees, as this doesn't really remove any vital trees on the property. They're all either dead or down already, and that makes great firewood. And every year, you're probably going to have some windstorms and lose a tree or two. If you plan on doing forest management and uh, logging, five, five acres isn't going to be enough. I know a gentleman that runs a wood lot. He's uh, in his 70s now. He's been doing it all his life. And he has 100 acres. And that 100 acres gives him a sustainable harvest and a decent living. And he'll never run out of trees. My opinion, even a three to five acre scenario, you're going to need a tractor to drag and haul wood back to the house. I know some people are going to say, well, why don't you just rent one? Well, first of all, we got 60 months financing on one at zero interest, and right now, zero interest is a good rate. Uh, besides that, there are so many times when we just say, I'm gonna go get on the tractor and I'm gonna go do this task or that task that we wouldn't do if we had to go out and rent one. You can buy a small entry-level tractor with a bucket for around 200 bucks a month. We got a John Deere 1023E with a $2,500 down payment and 200 bucks a month zero interest. We're using a tractor on the average of about 10 hours a month. I even use it to carry my garbage can to the street, which is about a quarter mile from my house. When we first moved here, uh, dragging the trash can to the street was a chore. One that I, I can't say is impossible, uh, but now that we have the tractor, we just throw the garbage can in the bucket and drive it up the street. I can transport tools, etc., to any point in the property. It makes it much easier. And of course, any tractor in the Northwest should have four-wheel drive. So this concludes this episode in the multi-part comprehensive series on moving to rural property. All of my contact information is below each video in the show more section, as well as my brokerage information. And with that, peace be with you, and thank you.